So this talk is going to be for hardware manufacturers and also vape cart manufacturers. So when we're talking about risk assessment, one thing to keep in mind is that everything in existence can cause harm. It's just how much you consume or how much you're exposed to that's going to cause a negative effect. So the idea is not to completely eliminate harm, but to minimize it for the safety of our consumers. <laughs> so this is the kind of the combination of risk. It is the hazard, which is the individual chemical, and it's also the exposure, which is how much the person is getting exposed to. So for example, different hazards, we have cyanide. I'm sure everyone's familiar with cyanide, extremely toxic, very, very low levels. And then we have ethanol, right? Ethanol's what's in our alcohol, and that can be toxic, but generally a much higher level than cyanide. So ethanol, when does it become toxic? Um, if I have a glass of wine at dinner, I might not feel anything at all. Um, I might not have any negative effects. Maybe I feel a little bit more social. Maybe I feel a little bit more funny. I don't know if I actually am though. <laughs> and then the next day I'll wake up and probably be totally fine. Now, let's say I just finished my talk tonight. I wanna celebrate, I have a bottle of wine. That bottle of wine, I might feel a little bit more. I might have a dry mouth. I might have slurred speech. The next morning, I might wake up with a hangover, a headache. So again, the risk to a bottle of wine is gonna be much higher than a glass of wine. Now, what if someone gets really ambitious and tries to drink a whole barrel of wine in a night? Odds are they may not survive to the next day. So as we can see, the exposure is really important in this combination when we're talking about risk. So the only way to completely eliminate the risk is to completely eliminate the exposure to the hazard. However, when we're talking about cannabis, we know that patients and consumers find really good purpose for cannabis. It helps them in many different ways. So we obviously don't wanna remove the exposure of cannabis. So the idea is to lower the risk to negligible levels so consumers can enjoy these products for years to come. And another aspect of exposure that is tied to risk is how the consumer is exposed to it. And we're talking about vapes today, so I'm gonna be focusing mainly on inhalation exposure. And inhalation exposure is a higher risk than oral exposure because of how it travels through our body. So not only are we inhaling a, a product that doesn't have a lot of safety research, unfortunately, um, but we're also getting exposed to it at a much higher risk level. So it's really important to keep this work in mind when you're creating these products. So I work at True Terpenes, and at True Terpenes, I created a toxicology program where I did a risk assessment of all of the materials we use in our products. Um, that's, I, I think I'm at like 170 materials now, and they all have their unique acceptable limit. So the unique exposure limit where the risk is gonna be negligible. And I've created this online database that industry workers can, um, can access, and I kind of like to call it the FEMA of cannabis industry, because cannabis industry, we don't have the regulations that says this product's okay to inhale, this product's not okay to inhale. So here at True Turbine, we just kind of made it ourselves. And then because this work was so important, I decided to collaborate with other industry leaders and also academia to create this guide that non-toxicologists can use to assess the risk of ingredients that go into their inhalable products. And again, we thought it was so important, we published it in an open access peer review journal so anyone can access this information for free. Now, you do all this work, you say this additive is okay to use in my inhalable product, I'm gonna put it in my vape cart, but what if the vape cart 
is not working properly or is not built properly and is now exposing those consumers to additional chemicals that wasn't in the liquid before. So vape safety or hardware safety is tied to two main factors. One is going to be metal contamination, which is currently regulated in the cannabis industry, and the other is overheating. So first I'm going to talk about metal contamination. Um, so we know it's regulated in the cannabis industry. Most states only regulate four metals. I believe Michigan regulates six metals. Good for them. Um, and remember, when we talk about metal contamination, the plant can also be a source of metals in addition to your hardware. So when you're a hardware manufacturer or you're testing your vape extract out of the hardware for metal contamination, make sure to test the extract before it goes in the hardware because that also could be providing metals. Okay, so why do we care if consumers are inhaling metals? Um, well, they're not safe, or else I wouldn't be talking about it if they were safe. <laughs> so they're not safe. Um, for example, cadmium and chromium are carcinogenic. Um, chromium is especially concerning because it is carcinogenic to the respiratory tract. So if it's getting inhaled directly into the lungs, that's really, really bad. And then lead and mercury are neurotoxins as well as other metals can impose hazards. So one thing to keep in mind when you're looking at metal contamination of the hardware is to avoid false passing levels. Um, I looked at different hardware companies, they've sent me their lab results and I see that the LOQ, which is the limit of quantification, which is essentially the lowest level they can even see, that limit is higher than what the regulated action limit is. So if that metal is in there above the action limit level, that lab couldn't even see it. So you're getting this false positive result. So you really need to make sure to look at the LOQ levels from the lab that's doing the testing and make sure it is lower than what the regulated action limit is. Second is to test under real world use conditions. Again, I get these lab results and they have a little picture of a vape cart that they tested and the liquid inside is clear. I'm like, are you testing with water? Are you testing with propylene glycol, which is water soluble? Because that's not what cannabis oil is. Cannabis is an oil and oils and water behave completely opposite from each other. So if it doesn't have metal extract, or it doesn't have metal leaching with water or propylene glycol, that doesn't mean it won't have metal leach with cannabinoid extract. Especially if you add terpenes, which we know cannabinoid extract has terpenes naturally in it. So it's really important when you're doing these types of testing to make sure you're testing with the same extract matrix that is gonna be going in the final product that consumers are gonna be accessing. Okay, so a lot of people when they're talking about metal leaching, talk about aerosol testing. That comes up in conversation a lot. And I believe Colorado tried, or is currently trying to set up testing parameters where you test the aerosol for metal leaching. However, there are major pitfalls currently with the method. A, there is no validated methods out there. There is not a consistent smoking topography method that is relevant to cannabis users. Um, it's very inefficient. It takes about a couple hours to vape enough of the extract to get enough sample to analyze for metal contamination. You can only do a few vapes at a time. So it's extremely inefficient and it costs a lot of money. There's not many labs in the entire world that are knowledgeable enough to do aerosol testing of cannabinoids. I've done it, it's really not easy. So I believe that a good alternative today, at least until we get better methods for aerosol testing, is to do a long-term metal leaching, which is gonna be more representative of what the consumer is actually picking off the shelf and getting exposed to. Right now, I believe 
a hardware company puts the extract in, sends it to the lab. Three days later, the lab pulls it out and tests it. Well, no consumer is getting access to that product that quickly. So that's not representative of what the consumer is inhaling. We still don't know if it's safe for the consumer. So I did this test in-house where I compared metal leaching with aerosol testing versus long-term. I tested nine different hardware brands. I used a Delta-8 THC matrix because I, we're not REC, so we can't use D9, um, but I felt like that was a very good representative. And I put 10% terpenes in because we know, again, terpenes are naturally found in cannabis. So the long-term leaching, put the extract in, stored it in a cool, cold, dry, dark place for 30 days, pulled that extract out, sent it in for metals. And then vaping, connected it to a smoking machine, vaped it through about half of the one gram cart, tested the extract again for metal leaching. And I compared the metal leaching results to Michigan's action limits because they tested for the most metals. And what I found for the vaping, only two out of the nine failed. But for the long-term, we had four of the nine failed. That's almost half of these products would fail regulations just sitting in their hardware for 30 days. I don't think that's crazy to believe that consumers are gonna be using these products 30 days after manufacturing days. So, what do we find out? Metals are leaching over time, more so than through use. And these results align very well with a published paper by Amber Wise, who did a fantastic job creating a method for aerosol testing. She also looked at long-term testing, found very similar results. And the best thing about this is this can be performed in-house at a, any manufacturing facility. You don't need special analytical equipment. You don't need any fancy tools to do this. Um, so this, like I definitely encourage hardware manufacturers and vape product manufacturers to do this testing on their products. Okay, so let's say you do this testing and you find, oh my God, all these metals are leaching. We're way higher than regulated limits. What do I do about it? Um, so you can use higher quality raw materials. You can uh, check the metal contamination of the ceramic wick because ceramic does contain metals in it. You could switch to all ceramic hardware. Naturally, it's gonna have less metals than like a stainless steel hardware. And if you are a hardware manufacturer, look into redesigning how your hardware is made. Um, you know, solder, reduce soldering joints. Solder oftentimes has tin and other um, hazardous metals in it, so if you can reduce how many points of soldering occur, you can lower the metals. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to overheating. Um, overheating is my favorite topic with hardware because I feel like it's not talked about enough, but it's definitely major point of hazard for the consumer. So overheating is when the extract heats beyond what is necessary to aerosolize or vaporize it. And this causes degradation, thermal degradation, oxidation, new product formation. And oftentimes these new products that are formed are extremely toxic. So this can happen due to overpowering, right? Is the volt set too high? Is the resistance not right? Poor wicking. Um, what size of ceramic are you using? And then overall hardware design. So if you go back to like general chemistry and remember this lovely phase diagram, what we're talking about is this like liquid to phase change area. So as you heat up the product, that heat, it starts off as energy. And that energy goes into heating the liquid extract up and then once it hits a certain point, then all of that extract goes into a phase change and there's no temperature increase as you have that phase change. And that's where we wanna stay. However, if you no longer have extract available to vaporize, then that energy is gonna turn into heat 
and heat it way beyond that phase change area, and that's when you're gonna get these thermal degradation products. Okay, so, as I mentioned previously, when you overheat things, oftentimes you're creating new products that are more toxic. So, some examples, formaldehyde. Um, we probably all know formaldehyde, it's extremely carcinogenic, it's very, very bad, you definitely don't wanna be inhaling it. Um, acrolin, acrolin is also very, very toxic. It can be cardiotoxin, among other things. Um, benzene, benzene is also extremely carcinogenic. Um, then, you know, the list goes on. Acetaldehyde, that's very toxic. Um, methacrylin, et cetera, et cetera. So, you definitely don't want any consumers to be inhaling these products. Um, in addition to the safety aspect, this can also affect the experience for the consumer. Imagine if you are burning all of those high, volatile, really great, sweet, tasting terpenes, the consumer is not gonna have the same experience. It's gonna have a poor taste, it may even taste burnt, the aroma's not gonna be great. And in addition to that is the effects that the consumer feels. So whether you believe it or not, um, there is the entourage effect. We just heard from the previous speaker that terpenes do affect uh, the body's mechanisms. And so if you are burning off all those terpenes, you can change the effect that the consumer is experiencing because they're not getting the same profile as they purchased. So one way to test for overheating is vaping experiments, or aerosolization experiments by a smoking machine and you can analyze for carbonyls. And carbonyls are again formaldehyde, acrylin, acetaldehyde, et cetera. Um, so that's the easiest way there's methods published out there to do it. Um, it does require special lab equipment, right? It's kind of the same aerosol testing as for metal leaching. Um, a little bit different, but so you might have to partner with an outside lab to do this type of testing. Um, and you must analyze the hardware with cannabinoid extract so that it represents, again, real world use conditions. That's what people are using these products with, so that's what we should be testing. Um, and so again, make sure when you partner with an outside lab that they have experience using cannabinoid extracts for this kind of testing. But, since you do have to partner with an outside lab and it is expensive or you have to buy all the equipment yourself and that's a cost, is there a way that we can estimate overheating or heating efficiency? So this goes back to a research project I did in graduate school. Um, it was looking at nicotine vaping, but I believe the theories are the same. So in grad school, I am tested this model, and what I found is the relationship between essentially the coil and the wick surface area, you can predict how many toxins are gonna be formed when you heat it up. One interesting caveat that I found is it was less related to one heating parameter. Um, so for example, it's not gonna be directly or to, related to the volts that it's set at. It's not that simple, so you have to kind of look at a combination of factors when we're talking about overheating. So the, this is an experiment you can do, again, in-house, and the, the components that you're gonna be looking at is the battery power, the coil style, the coil resistance, and the wick surface area. So you'll need to collect all that information and analyze it, and then you can like compare it or you can improve your hardware, whatever your goal is. So the different styles of coils. A lot of people don't even realize that there is a metal coil inside that ceramic grit. Um, if a hardware company tells you that they don't have it, that's 
pretty much a lie. <laughs> there is a metal coil inside every ceramic wick. And there's different styles that these coils could be. The most common one is single, which means you just have one wire wrapped and then it's surrounded by the ceramic. Then you also have parallel, which means you have two coils wrapped together encased by a single ceramic wick. And then you have a dual coil, which is two wires, but they're wrapped independently from each other and they're each surrounded by their own ceramic wick. Now, the heating efficiency is gonna be the dual is the most efficient, then the single is a close second, and parallel is going to be the farthest away from being the most efficient. And that's because you can create these hot spots in your wick. And what that means is for the, the parallel coil, if you have double the energy being applied to the exact same location, you're going to more quickly vaporize that extract that's there. And then again, it's gonna to lead to just that overheating, that high temperature ramp. And those are what I like to call hot spots. So the next parameter you're gonna to need to look for is the ceramic wick sizing. This is pretty easy. Once you take the card apart, it's two measurements and some math. You can find the equation on Google. I don't have it memorized either. <laughs> so it's essentially the height of the ceramic and then the diameter of the ceramic. And this is, you don't want the volume, you want the ceramic surface area because the ceramic surface area tells you how much extract is available to be aerosolized because it's going to be heated at the surface of the ceramic. Okay, the next part is your heat output. Um, and heat output is a function of voltage, wattage, and resistance. So the all-in-one hardwares have a bonus because they can kind of control this much better than 510 threads, but you can still design 510 threads or choose which 510 threaded hardware you want to use um, with the same theory. So all you really need to know is that the resistance and voltage work opposite of each other. So if you're going to have a very high resistance coil, then you're going to want to make sure it's paired with a battery that has a very low voltage. And if you are a 510 manufacturer or you sell 510 vape hardwares, you want to lower that resistance so that even if a consumer pairs it with really high voltage, you're still not, you're going to have the least amount of excess heating as you can. And if there are any hardware manufacturers in the audience that create batteries, please offer them at lower voltages. I see some batteries go up to voltage that's like 4.7 volts and that is way too high. No one needs it that high. Um, I think even 3.7 is considered high. So I would really love to see batteries that offer low voltage, even as low as like 2.4 and give the consumer the opportunity to choose what works best for them. Okay, so to do this, this these measurements and get these all parameters on your hardware is you need a few tools. Um, so you need a resistance reader. Um, and if you, you can buy these like vape resistance readers that I have pictured on the screen. Uh, they're really awesome. You just thread it in and then it tells you the resistance it is. Um, so that's great. Or if you have a multimeter, you can use like the multimeters with the little alligator clips. I'm sure you guys have seen them before and test the resistance. If you do use a multimeter, make sure it goes into sub-ohm levels. Because remember, when we're talking about vape hardware, we're talking about 0.9 to 5 ohms, so very small digits here. 
Um, next, I would get a caliper. Caliper is like that measuring device on the screen. Uh, it gives you really precise measurements of really small things, and when we're working with the wick, those can be very, very tiny. Uh, you need some pliers, some tweezers, some metal cutters, maybe get a hammer in there. Be safe and also have fun. It's very fun to take these apart. Okay, so how to deconstruct your cartridge. Um, obviously, if you are a hardware manufacturer, you might have the benefit of getting all of these pieces separately. But if you are a vape cart manufacturer, you're gonna have to take apart the hardware yourself. So the first step is to kind of take out the little button on the bottom, and then you can access the wires, you can record the resistance, etc. cetera. Um, then you'll need to break the outside of the tank, or if it's plastic, you can use like the metal cutters and kind of cut it and rip it off. Um, then you'll need to separate the atomizer, which is what houses the ceramic and the coil wick. And you can use it with metal cutters. If you have like actual tools, you can like cut it open. Um, you might have to get a little creative. I've definitely just taken a hammer to it before and eventually it falls apart. Um, <laughs> remember, be safe everybody. Um, and then once you have the atomizer loose, you can push out the ceramic wick. And I really want to stress, push it out. Do not pull it out from the coil wires because oftentimes you'll just rip the coil wires right out of the ceramic wick and then the ceramic wick may crumple and you might not be able to get um, exact measurements of that. So make sure to like take your tweezers and push it out. Okay, so then when you do that, you get all the measurements, record all the data, um, you'll have all these points. You'll have the ceramic wick diameter and height. You'll calculate the surface area. You'll understand what style of coil it is because you've actually pulled it apart. You've taken the coil resistance. And then if you have the battery access, like it's an all-in-one, you can have the volt output. Then you want to compare them all to each other. Um, so this is a great product if you are a vape manufacturer and you're looking to switch hardware you'll be able to compare all of them um, and look at all of these parameters together. And if you are a vape manufacturer, this is a great time to say, hey, maybe we should change some things a little bit. And you can also compare yourself to other products on the market. So you've done all this, now you want to mitigate the overheating problem. Um, you can increase ceramic size. You can go to a brand that has a larger ceramic surface area than another brand. You can switch to a dual coil design or choose a hardware manufacturer that already sells dual coils. You could reduce the resistance and you do that by getting different coil diameters or coil gauges. You can make the coil longer or shorter that'll change the resistance. And then for all in ones, oh man, it's so easy. Just lower that voltage. That's all you gotta do. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay, so some research that I would love to see happen in the future. Um, I'd love to see thermal degradation studies, remember those are those carbonyl smoking machine studies that compare different coil materials. Um, and so that's, did the wire coil can be made out of different metal. Um, in the cannabis space, the most common is nichrome. But in the nicotine space, the most common is canthal, and then there's also stainless steel. So I would love to see research to see if those materials affect the degradation of the extract. Um, I'd also love to see thermal degradation studies of larger hardware sizes. I hear all the time that people are going to 2 mil, 3 mil, 4 mil, 5 mil, like what happens to that ceramic, what happens to that coil, as it's being used hundreds and hundreds of times throughout a four mil life cart. No one has any idea what that happens. So I'd love to see how maybe we see more or less thermal de degradation products throughout the life of a cart. And then a metal leaching experiment using different extract matrices. Um, you know, the experiments I did used Delta-8 
maybe metals linked more or less using delta-9. What about a full-spectrum CBD extract, um, et cetera? There, there's lots of different chemistries that could be going on, and I'd love to see how that affects these uh, safety parameters. So that's all I have for you guys today. Um, thank you so much. I had a question about the variable voltage batteries that are provided. Um, they'll typically have like a high and a low. Um, the manufacturers will say that, you know, if they want more of a cloud, then switch to the higher voltage. Is that the reason that you're seeing people use these higher voltages is to create more of a vape cloud uh, for the consumer, which they say that's part of the, the positive experience when you can generate that vape cloud if you like, they've got a good quality product, but is that larger cloud also creating an overheating situation? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, the higher voltage will create more aerosolization, um, so you will have a higher, like larger cloud size, um, but I imagine it's gonna create more thermal degradation products. Um, one thing that would be interesting to look into is Maybe a dual coil style will provide the same cloud size, but at a lower voltage, so it's gonna be safer for the consumer because remember the dual coil has the largest wick surface area, so there's gonna be the most extract that's gonna be available for vaporization. So there might be other ways to get to that same consumer experience while mitigating the risk. Have you ever considered creating like a buyer's guide for big cart manufacturers that use those parameters as ratings for what's safest and maybe what's least safe? I have not, but I think that's a really great idea and I'd love to collaborate with someone that could help us get that out to consumers. Thank you. Hey there. Um, I was just wondering if you have any thoughts on possible effects of flow of the cannabinoids through the wick um, and it specifically in relation to burning. Uh, I know that for example, some big pens have a, a button on the side to activate the heating and could be in somebody's pocket and could activate you know erroneously whilst they're sitting down and could sit there and presumably heat up in a pocket and could burn cannabinoids and I've seen the oil uh, brown, I've seen dark brown colors in oil and I wondered if that was related to burning from activation at long time. Yeah, that could definitely be the cause. I mean, accidentally hitting the button and having it last for a very long time is not going to be good at all, um, especially because when that happens, you're not getting that airflow that's actually pulling that heat <laughs> and that vapor out of the cartridge. So it's really just sitting in there, heating up, definitely getting to that like overheating phase. Um, you know, and that could ruin the consumer's hardware, you know, for the rest of that, uh, that time. As far as the color change, um, that is a very complex thing. And we, what we've seen is that the color change doesn't always indicate a safety risk. Um, so I would take the color change with a grain of salt just because it's a dark color doesn't mean you're creating toxic compounds. Um, that's just like a natural oxidation process. A lot of products go through that and being in a clear vape car, you're going to be exposed to more UV light and potentially more photo oxidation. Um, but again, that doesn't always mean it's an unsafe product now. Just to finish up, I wonder if there's a way to build in a safety mechanism to monitor the flow. So if the button is pressed in somebody's pocket, the device knows that they're not pulling and, and it would prevent burning. Yeah, I definitely think that can be done and has been done. I know that exists in the nicotine space. 
So I imagine there are cannabis uh, hardware manufacturers that have built in those kinds of fail safes. Hi, um, just wondering, um, do you have any experience uh, with um, like different materials such as rosins with a heavier lipid or uh, fat concentration and how they um, agree or disagree with different hardwares or like any recommendations because I've been trialing different hardware or different concentrations of fats but I'm looking at new hardware to look into to you know mesh better. <coughs> Yes, we personally at True Terpenes haven't been able to look at that because we um, don't have a recreational license to analyze that, but we do partner with a lot of hardware brands that have done testing and created hardware specifically for rosin, and there's a few parameters that they change. Um, the aperture hole size, they've changed that uh, to help with the rosin. Also, you can get ceramic that has different porosity sizes, so that's another thing that hardware manufacturers are experimenting with. Okay, thank you. Let's thank our speaker.